Welcome to the Evergreen Thumb. I'm your host, Erin Landon, a Washington State University Extension Master Gardener since 2015 and a certified permaculture designer and modern homesteader. I'm here to share up-to-date research-based horticulture and environmental stewardship knowledge to help you grow and manage your garden and to share what the WSU Extension Master Gardener program is all about. WSU Extension Master Gardener volunteers are university-trained community educators who have been cultivating plants, people, and communities since 1973. Are you ready to grow? Let's dig into today's episode. Welcome to the Evergreen Thumb, Episode 9. My guest today is David James, and he's here today to talk to us about pollinators, specifically in winter, as well as creating year-round pollinator habitat. David became an entomologist at 8 years old by rearing caterpillars in his English bedroom. A science degree in the UK was followed by a PhD on monarch winter biology in Sydney, Australia, and a lifetime of applied entomological research including biological control, chemical ecology, pest management, insect and pollinator conservation in Australia and the Pacific Northwest. In 2011, he co-authored The Life Histories of Cascadia Butterflies, which David Attenborough called Magisterial. In January 2024, his new book, The Lives of Butterflies, will be published by Princeton. David, thank you for being here today and welcome to the show. Thank you. So to get started, um, how about you tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with pollinators? Well, it's quite a long story, really. I mean, I've been an entomologist all my life, really. I was one of those guys that was eight years old and fell in love with caterpillars in the garden, and uh, and it just developed from then. So I, I knew at that point I wanted to be an entomologist, and so during my career, I've you know, been involved with many types of insects and many different um, ways of looking at them. Um, But over the last decade or so, pollinators have really been my forte, I guess. Okay. And I understand that you have a particular interest in um, butterflies? Yes. It was the butterfly caterpillars that got me involved in the first place. And uh, so, yeah, um, butterflies are my favorite group of insects, I guess. And uh, And I've worked on them throughout my career. All right. Um, So we're talking primarily about pollinators during the winter and how we can support them and create habitat for them. So to start, can you tell us a little bit about the importance of pollinators in the winter months and their role in the garden ecosystem in the winter? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, during our winters in eastern Washington, um, there is no pollination going on, but the pollinators are often still there in you know, a suburban backyard. And so we, you know, we need to look after them and and not do the wrong things. And uh, one of the first things that a lot of people do that is wrong is to clean up in the autumn, you know, this time of year to to, uh, deadhead everything and uh, mow the lawn very low um, and, you know, make it clean, basically, or tidy. Um, And that's the total opposite of what the pollinators need uh, because they're often resting or hiding or overwintering in those places that you're um, cleaning up. And, uh, you know, if you're taking all the leaves away, um, putting them in a sack or burning them, you're you're probably burning stages of pollinators. I don't mean necessarily the adults, but they're immature stages um, that use those sort of uh, habitats and refugia to survive the winter. So can you share some examples of plants that bloom in the winter that might attract pollinators in western Washington? I know in eastern Washington, it's not so much. Um, And even in western Washington, there's not a great deal of flowering. Um, And so, you know, if there is any pollinator activity, it is fairly minimal. I mean, if you go down to California, of course, um, it's it's quite different. But even even there, it's at a lower level than during the summer months. Uh, Most pollinators have an overwintering stage in uh, Western North America um, that, you know, diminishes the further south you go. But in Western Washington, the bulk of pollinators will be dormant in some way. And maybe they'll come out on uh, warmer days, particularly after after the new year, uh, January, February, uh, once the days start lengthening, which is often a cue that they use, you know, the days are getting longer. And if there's some warm weather, they will take advantage of that. 
so they're ready to pollinate the first spring flowers, which are on the west side, you know, can occur in January. What are some ways that gardeners can create habitat that will support uh, pollinators, especially bees and butterflies during the winter, to give them a place to spend the winter? Yeah, really, it's it's just a matter of um, of leaving what's there, the summer growth. I mean, you know, seed heads, um, some uh, twigs and uh, um, sticks of plants that are just still there. Uh, some bees will use them to um, overwinter in. You can buy um, things for overwintering. You know, you can buy little butterfly houses, um, but there's no evidence that they actually work because the butterflies will find their own habitats. I mean, with butterflies, they're, they're looking for um, trees. Um, they'll sometimes just be sitting on the bark of a tree and often they're camouflaged to, to blend in. Um, so they don't need anything special. They're, you know, under, um, under, uh, maybe in a tree hole or just on the bark, um, in a you know, shady part of the tree. Um, and sometimes they'll, they'll go into garden sheds too, uh, this time of year or in the past few weeks. Um, you know, butterflies, the ones that do overwinter as adults anyway, have been looking for a place to overwinter. Um, so they're, they're very good at finding places. And so there's not a lot that we can do to help them except to, you know, make sure you're not cutting everything down, you know, basically. I mean, that that really is the, the major message is, is uh, to leave the cleanup of the garden until spring, uh, once temperatures are above, um, you know, 55, 60, when most insects start moving again and leave their overwintering quarters, then that really is the time, you know, to clean up, if you like, and uh, and get ready for the spring growth. Okay. I was in my garden a couple of weeks ago and found a swallowtail caterpillar, and it decided to build its cocoon on a cinder block in the garden. Um, is there any concerns with it being able to survive being exposed on the? No, no. no. Um, that's uh, as long as the cinder block is not in a place that someone's going to tread on it or, you know, or get damaged in some way. But, you know, butterfly swallowtail, butterfly pupae are um, formed in places that are exposed and uh, they're camouflaged so they don't attract attention. You know, once the caterpillar's molted into the chrysalis stage, um, it's, it's a color that often matches the background um, and they are able to do that. And so, you know, the, the chrysalis that you have may actually resemble the color of the, the cinder block. Um, and so, so no, they, they don't need any special um, covering or, or shelter. Okay. Um, I know mason bees have been a popular pollinator topic and there are like, we have mason bee houses um, to, for them, but they have a very short season in the spring, right? Yeah, yeah. They, you know, most um, native bees uh, go through a number of generations uh, during the season. Um, so, um, you know, most people don't realize that backyards are very good habitat for for many native bees. Um, 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 you know, we don't know that much about all of the native bees that we have. You know, we're still learning. Um, about the species we have. Um, there's far more species out there than entomologists realized maybe, you know, a decade ago. Um, so um, it's, and it is important for urban areas to, you know, pay attention to, you know, the conservation of these insects um, because um, much research has shown that uh, even a backyard can provide a very useful, important habitat for um pollinators and insects generally um you know in the past we tended to dismiss you know urban backyards as not being that important um but we are realizing that um from research being done all over the world the urban spaces um particularly if they're cared for and, and uh um, and created um as habitat for pollinators and insects generally then they can serve a very useful function great are there specific gardening practices or techniques other than not making the yard too tidy that will help protect overwintering pollinators? No, not not really. Um, I mean, um, as long as the places that they are overwintering in are not disturbed, um, then they'll be fine. Um, there's, you know, they, you know, all insects that, you know, are resident in 
in Washington are very well adapted to survive in our winters. Um, so, you know, we don't need to help them get through the winter in terms of uh, how severe it might be, um, because they're, they're all extremely well adapted to doing that, the ones that are, are resident here. Um, so, so yeah, there, there's not a lot you can do to help them during the winter, apart from the things that we said, you know, make sure that you leave places for them. Okay. How can we turn our gardens into a, a habitat for for pollinators? What type of um, plants or shrubs, perennials, annuals, um, you know, can attract them, feed them, things like that? I, it's it's all of those things that you just mentioned, really, and and I guess it, it would pay to have a plan if you want to attract butterflies in particular, then there are certain plants that you can use that will attract more butterflies. Um, uh, but if it's just general pollinators, then you don't have to go overboard on those particular plants, perhaps. Um, so, so yeah, you need to know what you're, um, what you're wanting. Um, if you want to talk about butterflies, uh, there's, there's, you know, specific plants like milkweed that everybody is familiar with the monarch butterfly and the fact that uh, milkweed is essential for them to survive on for their caterpillars to develop upon um, but milkweed flowers are also extremely important for other pollinators too which is a little known fact um, that other butterflies and also bees um, are very uh, drawn to and, and, and utilize milkweed flowers uh, to a great extent um, and if you you know I you know I don't know if you want me to go through a list, um, but the list is long. Uh, and really, it you know, native plants are probably, um, if you're talking about butterflies and pollinators generally, um, most of our pollinators are native. So it makes sense that we provide them with native plants. Um, I, I'm not a purist in that I don't, you know, say that we shouldn't have any other types of plants there at all, because that's, you know, that, that's silly. Um, there are certain ornamental plants that are also very attractive to pollinators and do provide a valuable service to that spring to mind are lavender and buddleia or, or butterfly bush. Um, both of those are extremely attractive to, to butterflies and other pollinators. Um, and, uh, and they do well in, in home gardens. Uh, you have to be careful on the west side that uh, buddleia doesn't um, uh, become invasive, which you can do if there's too much moisture, um, but you can get sterile varieties of that plant. But on the east side, um, it's it's really a problem in in that regard, uh, that particular bush. Um, but but yes, natives, and, and and if you want butterflies to, um, you know, not just dash in and dash out again to feed on the nectar, um, you can start thinking about growing host plants, um, particularly if, if you have a slightly larger block, um, you can grow uh, certain of their host plants that will allow them to breed in your backyard. Um, and so, you know, there's some examples like uh, a lot of butterflies utilize grasses as uh, their larval host plant. Uh, some brown butterflies do this. Um, so if you, if you have got a large yard and you can spare a corner where you can let native grasses grow, um, you could well provide a habitat for, for, for their breeding. And there's other examples too um, of host plants. And so I get, as I said at the beginning, if you want to develop a butterfly garden, then you need to do a little bit of research and discover which types of plants um, would be appropriate for that. Okay. I know I've seen um, caterpillars on, I think it was fennel. Uh, yes. Swallowtails like the the fennel. That's right. Yes, that's that's a, a good example of a plant that is quite good at attracting swallowtail butterflies to lay their eggs on and uh, and produce caterpillars. Um, and you know, and fennel isn't necessarily native. It isn't native, but they will utilize that as well as their native host plants too. And so there are some butterflies like that as well that that will use. Um, not just native plants. Um, another good one that I'll mention that um, will probably uh, maybe disturb some people because um, it's stinging nettles. Mm. And uh, not many people like stinging nettles, although some people on the West Side, I, I know, do cultivate them to use as herbal 
type of tea. Um, so they are useful for that. But uh, a lot of people do not know that they also support uh, the life history of five colorful Pacific Northwest butterflies, including the red admiral, the small uh, tortoiseshell butterfly, uh, painted ladies. Um, and so having a patch of nettles in an out of the way place in your backyard um, could well uh, entice butterflies to come in, uh, lay their eggs, and uh, you'd see a lot more of them in the garden than if you didn't have stinging nettles there. Yeah, I love steaming nettles, but our property is just way too dry. It won't support it. So um, yes. so if anybody yes. does want to pl plant nettles, you need to have kind of a damp location for them to thrive. So are there any resources or organizations that can help gardeners learn more about creating pollinator-friendly habitats? Yes, uh, the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation is the, is the prime source of a lot of um, this material. They're, they're excellent at producing um, documentation. Uh, there's a couple of good books. Um, there's one uh, specific for um, attracting butterflies to your backyard, I think. And there's also one on, oh, we've got it here actually, on native pollinators, uh, attracting native pollinators to the backyard. Um, or to other areas too. It's not just backyards, um, you know, parks and um, reserves. So, so yes, um, the website too, the Xerxes Society website is also um, a fountain of information. Um, so that would be my first stop if, if you're interested in, in looking at resources for developing your garden as a habit, uh, as a pollinator friendly habitat. There's also many resources online if you just Google you know, the key words, and there's a lot of books too. So there's there's no shortage. Um, the good thing about the Xerxes books is that there's actually sections on different parts of the country. So obviously what works for us isn't necessarily going to work for Connecticut or, you know, Texas or something. So um, you need to be aware of that when you read some of these other books to, you know, make sure you tailor it for um, our uh, landscape and our environment. And they, they provide lists of plants that are suitable for the different uh, regions too. Okay. Is there any particular research going on right now um, related to uh, conservation of pollinators or pollinator habitat? Yes, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of uh, research being done at the moment. I mean, ever since um, people became aware that uh, pollinators were in trouble, um, 10, 15 years ago now, um, there's been a, a very big push in the research community to learn more about pollinators because, you know, in the past, we didn't really focus on pollinators much at all because they were there, they were present. You know, most of the research was done on controlling bad insect pests, you know. Um, and so the focus really wasn't on pollinators, but that that's changed substantially now. Um, and all over the world, People are looking at the types of pollinators, their biology and ecology. As I mentioned earlier, we know so little about the species for, for a start, let alone what they actually do and their, their life histories. So we're working on that. And also, importantly, um, the conservation. This is why I mentioned the importance of urban landscapes. There's a lot of papers being produced recently looking at or, just, or demonstrating the importance of you know, big cities, um, their parks and gardens within places like Seattle and Los Angeles and other big cities of the world and just how um, important those green spaces are in preserving and sustaining pollinator populations. I mean, pollinators are very adaptable and resilient and, uh, and so they're, they're not they're not flaky, for want of a better word. Uh, they're, they're, they're pretty. Ro they're more robust than we give them credit for. And the same goes for butterflies too. You know, I've been around butterflies all my life, and uh, everybody thinks that they're weak and and, uh, and not robust. But that that's not true. Most of them are very resilient, and uh, and they have to be. You know, they've adapted over millennia to to the environment, so they're much tougher than we give them credit for. But they can still use a helping hand, of course, and and that's you know what we're talking about now. And uh, there's no doubt that you know in this time when um, habitat loss, which is one of the major drivers of habit, uh, of pollinator decline, um, is happening at a great scale, 
Um, pollinators do need our help. So um, if we can find that urban landscapes are a benefit, then that's great because, you know, everybody can do their bit. All right. Another question I just thought of, uh, kind of off the top of your head, when it comes to, say, like a vegetable garden that you want to attract pollinators to have your crops pollinated, better pollination, um, are there specific um, companion plants that tend to attract bees and other pollinators? Yeah, there are. Um, and I can't think of them off the top of my head. But, you know, things like lavender, uh, uh, there, there's certainly uh, a lot of companion type plant tins that you can use to um, attract more uh, pollination. Um, so, yeah, that, that that's another thing you can do. And, and uh, you know, the knowledge is get in there now you know i say there's a lot of research being done now but at the same time it's being extended to things like the xerces society and their their books and such like okay is there anything else that you'd like to add about pollinators or butterflies in particular that you'd like people to know um well it's i guess the the message really is that um and I touched upon it just a moment ago, is that, you know, with the loss of habitat and, and the use of pesticides, they're the two prime drivers of insect and pollinator decline. Um, and uh, that is a real thing. You know, insects generally, not just pollinators, are declining. Um, and as one famous entomologist said, uh, it's the small insects that run the, well, the small things that run the world. Um, and that's literally true. And, and so, you know, once we start losing insects um then we lose other things too and there's there's studies showing you know with a reduction of insect populations um followed on from that there's a reduction in bird populations that, that feed on the insects so and so that's that's the great thing about gardens and um, urban landscapes is that you can do your part for helping the decline in insect and pollinator populations um, on a small scale and everybody does it then um it improves the situation across the landscape. Uh, so you don't have to feel like um, you're not doing anything. You can, can actually do something. And the other thing about urban landscapes, I guess, that's become a bit of a, uh, a keynote at the moment is, uh, you know, the fact that we have so much lawn scapes, you know, just, just lawns, which could be, you know, turned into something a, a bit more pollinator friendly. Um, and, and that is a movement that is taking place um, throughout the world, you know, people realising that um, we, can, we can change that. Um, and it's a e relatively easy thing to do, not saying get rid of every lawn, but, but you know, the, the vast expanses of lawn are, are not necessarily, you know, they're, not, they're certainly not helping pollinator populations or insect populations generally. And just a bit of diversification. I guess that's the key word, word is diversity. And that goes for, you know, establishing a, a pollinator garden is to make it as diversified as possible um, and you'll have the best rewards. I mean, the more diverse plant structure there is, the more diverse the insect community is going to be. And so, you know, lawns are sort of the antithesis of that. And uh, if we can move away from that, and I think we will over the decades in the future, then that's going to be a great bonus for pollinators and insects generally. Okay. I just thought of one last question. Um, are there particular native plants that or would be best for pollinators, um, you know, that tend to attract a wide variety? Yeah, there's, there's certain groups of plants that are very good. Um, asters spring to mind. Uh, da daisy compositate. The, the daisy family is, um, you know, you can't go wrong with them. Uh, all the pollinators like them. Simple open flowers are generally the best you know, where the insect can land on the flower and, and feed. There's, uh, oh, I've gone blank now, the mint, the mint family is another good one. Valerian is, a, is another good plant. There, there's many different types, really. Um, and, you know, there's, we shouldn't ignore native uh, bushes, too. Um, this time of year in, the, in eastern Washington, actually throughout the western U.S., uh, the rabbit brush bush, um, which you know, it's a yellow flowering plant that's all across the landscape. It's extremely important for pollinators because it's one of the few nectar sources that's available at this time of year. Um, and we've done some research here at WSU looking at um, the importance of rabbit brush and also sagebrush 
too, which also flowers at this time of year. These are plants that are dominant on the landscape and, and sort of ignored by people because they're just everywhere. But we're discovering that they are very important, uh, both in terms of shelter, you know, sagebrush provides shelter, you know, on our treeless landscape. Um, sagebrushes are very important in providing shelter for insects. Um, and then rabbit brush flowering as it does during August and September and into October, it's only just finishing now, um, is one of the few nectar sources, native nectar sources available for our uh, native insects. So, you know, if I was established in a pollinator garden, the rabbit brush would definitely be in there. Okay, that's one I'm not familiar. I'm familiar with sagebrush, but not the others. So I'll have to look into that one. I have scotch broom. <laughs> okay. Well, it's it's not it's not on the west side, so it's on the east side, and all the way down to California, um, any dry desert type area, you'll see this yellow flowering bush um, that looks a bit like sagebrush, but it has these beautiful yellow flowers, and uh, it actually is. I'm I'm discovering in my research on the monarch butterfly, um, one of the without rabbit brush, they wouldn't have the fuel to migrate to California. So, and that's probably the same for other migrating insects. And there are others as well that also head south. Um, so I think uh, rabbit brush is a, is a very um, underestimated, undervalued resource that, that we have here in inland parts of the Pacific Northwest. So our, is the monarch migration, is Washington, does Washington tend to be a, a major spot for the monarchs to migrate through? Yeah, in some years, particularly this year, uh, I'm actually monitoring sightings of monarchs. And during the first uh, 20 days of October, uh, we had 30 verified reports of monarch migra monarchs migrating, um, mostly down rivers and across the countryside, feeding on uh, things like rabbit rush, heading south. So, so yeah, they they're um, you know by October it's getting a bit late, but luckily up until now uh, we've had pretty good weather and. Uh, they should make the journey all, all the way down to California. But, but yeah, uh, they come up to Washington every year, uh, some years better than others, uh, spend the summer here, then return at this time of year. Great. All right. Anything else you'd like to add? I could go on and on. <laughs> I guess one thing I should mention is that um, in a lot of my work at WSU, we focused on beneficial insects. Um, and by that I mean I mean, pollinators, but, but also predators and parasites of pests, you know, and that work originated in agriculture. Um, but it's also applicable to the home garden, um, you know, because home gardens have insect pests that you don't particularly want. Um, and so by growing the sort of plants that attract pollinators, it turns out you also attract these other types of beneficial insects too. And I'm talking about things like lacewings and uh, lady beetles, um, you know, the beneficial bugs, insects that, that eat aphids and mites and things like that. The plants that we're talking about for pollinators will attract them too. And we've documented this. We've uh, published papers on it. Um, things like stinging nettles again, native buckwheats, which are also good for growing in the eastern parts of Washington. They all attract other types of beneficial insects, the predators and parasitoids, uh, which control pests. So, so really, you're getting a two for one, if you like. You're, you know, you're attracting uh, pollinators, but also the other types of beneficial insects as well, which adds, as I said before, to the diversity, the community um, that you know you can you can create in your backyard. And you know, the upshot from that will be less pest problems. Um, all this doesn't happen overnight, of course. It's, we're talking about, you know, establishing a garden along the lines we've talked about over um, a few years, and probably five years uh, before you start seeing these kind of benefits. But but they will happen. Yeah, well, it's like we've had our vegetable garden in place for seven years now, and this is the first swallowtail caterpillar I've seen just this yeah. year. So, yeah, they do come eventually. Yeah. Well, as they say, you, know, you plant it and they will come. Right. Yeah. What I have noticed, we actually have a lot of cinnabar moth in this area. My understanding is that they were introduced to help control the tansy ragwort, and so yeah. they um and they apparently find plenty of food. <laughs> yeah, they they're they're attractive. 
uh, and they they only feed on ragwort, so they're doing their job as they were intended to do. And uh, they, as I said, they're, they're very attractive moths and the caterpillars too. So, yeah, we don't get them on the east side, unfortunately, but we don't get ragwort either. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope uh, everybody gets a lot out of how to or how to add pollinators to their garden and take care of them and not make things too tidy going into winter. Right. That's it. That's the message. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Evergreen Thumb, brought to you by the WSU Extension Master Gardener Program volunteers and sponsored by the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. We hope that today's discussion has inspired and equipped you with valuable insights to nurture your garden. The Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State is a nonprofit organization whose primary purpose is to provide unifying support and advocacy for WSU Extension Master Gardener programs throughout Washington State. To support the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State, visit www.mastergardenerfoundation.org forward slash donate. Whether you're an experienced Master Gardener or just starting out, the WSU Extension Master Gardener program is here to support you every step of the way. WSU Extension Master Gardeners empower and sustain diverse communities with relevant, unbiased, research-based horticulture education. Reach out to your local WSU Extension office to connect with Master Gardeners and tap into a wealth of resources that can help you achieve gardening success. To learn more about the program or how to become a Master Gardener, visit mastergardener.wsu.edu forward slash get hyphen involved. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to stay connected with us, be sure to subscribe to future episodes filled with expert tips, fascinating stories, and practical advice. Don't forget to leave a review and share it with fellow gardeners to spread the joy of gardening. Questions or comments to be addressed in future episodes can be sent to hello at theevergreenthumb.org. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed by guests of this podcast are their own and do not imply endorsement by Washington State University or the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. Mm -hmm.